Hello, and, and welcome <laughs> to our evening with Maggie Longmire. I'm Chris Derman, one of our music librarians and the coordinator of the Divine Music Library. This is the fifth event of the UT Library's Boundless Artists in the Archives series. Before I introduce this evening's featured guests, I'd like to explain our vision for the Boundless series. We created Boundless to raise public awareness of the cultural and research value of our special collections. Our Betsy B. Creekmore Special Collections and University Archives holds unique materials that exist nowhere else in the world. These are items such as letters, diaries, photographs, scrapbooks, and personal memorabilia. These items have been donated to our archives so that they can be preserved and shared with future generations. Of researchers and of primary, yeah, the future generations of researchers. They're primary source materials that inform historic research and make the past come alive. Our program, Boundless Artists in the Archives, demonstrates that the unique materials in our special collections are not only for scholarship, but they can also inspire new works. For this program, we invite artists to explore the collections and then create new works inspired by them. Tonight, we welcome Maggie Longmire. Maggie has been a long-standing voice in the local music scene. During her college years, she played folk rock, blues, and country with several bands on the Cumberland Avenue Strip. Some of y'all, it sounds, have been there. <laughs> In the 70s, she joined the Lonesome Coyotes, who many Knoxvilleans will remember from the Coyotes' frequent performances at the 1982 World's Fair. It was a good fit for Maggie, and she became a permanent member of the group, which eventually went on hiatus as other life priorities intervened. <laughs> Maggie's passion for songwriting, though, emerged when she took a break from performing. Her first CD of original songs, Teachers and Travelers, was followed by Grandparent, excuse me, Granddaughters, an American Opera, a collaboration with her brother, John Longmire. It tells the story of her mother's life in Campbell County, Tennessee in the early 1900s. Maggie returned to live performance in the early 2000s with the reformed Lonesome Coyotes, the acoustic group Free Soil Farm, and numerous duos and partnerships. In 2017, she released her third album, Baby It's Time, co-produced with Daniel Kimbrough and featuring some of Knoxville's finest musicians. Maggie spent her early childhood in La Follette, Tennessee. She has strong family roots up there in Campbell County, and her songwriting often reflects those roots. The coal mining legacy of our region is one of her recurring themes. Her album, Granddaughters, an American opera, in addition to portraying earlier generations of her own family, tells the stories of coal mining disasters and labor disputes in the Cumberland Mountains. Most recently, Maggie has used her music and activism to draw attention to the environmental devastation and human toil of coal mining. She has been outspoken in seeking compensation for workers injured in the cleanup of the massive coal ash spill at the TVA power plant near Kingston, Tennessee in 2008. When we invited her to visit our archives to find inspiration for her songwriting, Maggie expressed an interest in further exploring the history of Upper East Tennessee region from which she came. I am excited to finally get a chance to hear the debut performance of her original songs and to hear about the items from our special collections that inspired her. Please welcome Maggie Longmire. All right. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right. And thanks to all you guys for being here. I'm really blown away by this. And I'm seeing so many faces that I haven't seen in forever. Uh, it's been, yeah, 
and from so many different parts of my life. Wow. And there's an old lonesome coyote over there. And uh, we have, golly, so many friends out here. This is wonderful. I hope to get to speak to every one of you after we're done, if you're still around. Uh, it's been amazing to uh, be allowed back into the university. <laughs> uh, w when I was invited to this, I thought, well, I trust Chris Derman, and they want me to be a part of a program, and, I, and I'd be going to the library, and yeah, I, I think I'll do that. And um, I had no idea, really, other than my trust in Chris. Uh, of what I was getting myself into. And um, it was a great decision because it's been a wonderful experience. And um, the first day I came over to meet the team, the committee, and I want to acknowledge, I don't know who put this committee together. I don't have every name and I'll, you'll see me shuffling through this notebook a lot tonight so I hope it doesn't bother you. But um, the Boundless Committee um, consists of some folks that I just, I just think are outstanding. Each one of them with their own specialty and their own ability to uh, be of service to help me. Any, anything I wanted or needed, uh, they were just ready to say, how can we, how can we do that? How, how can we make that happen? And I, I, I got to work with, uh, with Chris and with Jennifer Beals, the assistant dean and head of the Betsy B. Creekmore Special Collections, and um, Shelley O'Barr, who is bringing us these beautiful slides back here and who has taken photos and videos, and we've just had a great time laughing and uh, enjoying the process of getting this whole, this whole thing rolled out. And uh, Anna Marie Russell, she kept us all in line. She held the calendar and she kept us make sure our meetings were scheduled. So I want to say a, a big thank you to all those folks. And a person who is, uh, I think, kind of likes to be behind the scenes, and, uh, but she's a, an old friend and incredible at what she does and everyone sings her praises, Miss Martha Rudolph. Yeah. yeah. And there are some other team members on that committee who, whose names I don't have in front of me, but I, I do want to acknowledge them because everybody brings their particular talent to this, and uh, I'm just uh, I'm just so thrilled that I had a had a, uh, a group like this to work with because I really didn't know where we were going, and they just made it easy. So I hope, I hope tonight as we, we spend some time, as Chris said, uh, revisiting uh, Campbell County. And uh, I, I did write an album with my brother and we, we, we told a lot of stories about family and the troubled times and the hard times and uh, issues around coal mining and but there's still more, there's so many more stories to tell. And um, uh, more, more to learn, more to learn from the past and as, as how we approach the future. And um, these first three songs that we do, pardon me, I have to have a little water here. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Why is it when you get nervous, your mouth just feels like you just sucked on a big cotton ball? Why, why is that? <laughs> uh, anyway, I know you guys are friends, and I'm going to relax and not be too nervous about uh, any kind of uh, my mind playing any tricks on me. Because if you don't want to be here, you know where the door is, right? <laughs> and it would be okay if, if this... If, What's funny is I, when I used to sing in the old days, I never spoke to the audience. I'm scared to death of you guys, right? Then I got to the point where I talked all the time. And, you know, I would take too long to introduce things. So during this little last few years with COVID and not performing and all that, 
I reviewed some old videos and I thought, Maggie, you do talk too much. <laughs> so I had decided my next time out, I was going to curtail my jabber, right? I was gonna just say, you know, just sing the dang songs and just go on and just maybe tell them the title or something. You know, yeah, it is, Chris, you gotta kinda, but then there's certain songs that if you don't set them up, maybe people don't get quite as much from them. But then I get this gig and Chris says, oh, talk about the songs. <laughs> so I guess, I guess I'm supposed to talk about the songs. So I, that's part of one of my pieces of the contract that I must talk. <laughs> so I'm just doing my job. Okay. Um, anyway, I want to let you guys know I've, I'm delighted that I'm joined with two old friends for this evening's concert, Greg Horn and Kathleen McGregor Williams. And I'm just so thrilled when they said yes that they would come do this. And um, we've, we haven't had a lot of time to work, uh, work up this show because they're so busy and things going on in their world and playing and weddings getting planned and numerous things going on. So we will, uh, we will be as crisp as we can with our deliveries, but uh, they're both pros and I love them and appreciate them. And um, one of the songs that we're gonna begin with, uh, and like I say, we're, we're gonna be spending time up in, in Campbell County. And so I want you to get the feel for that. And hopefully this beautiful photograph will, will kind of take you there. Um, this song was on the Granddaughters album, and it, a lot of people miss this, but it's called an Americana opera. And uh, it was selected, my brother uh, titled that, uh, because when we perform it, if any of you have ever seen that particular piece, we tell the story in time of where we are, so you know who the characters are. And this song is called Grandma, Mary Lou, and Me. So when people hear it, they think it's in my voice, but it's actually my mother's story. So just a little heads up. We're not talking about, we're not talking about me. This is my mother telling this story. And it's, uh, she was raised by her grandmother, she and her sister. And um, just a, a bit of history. This whole project for me has been about po little points of history and how things tie together in our lives. And, you know, after so many years, you've got a lot of those points of history. And so the things will pop up and they'll show up and, and you appreciate things in different ways. And uh, when I first met with the folks on the committee, I told them I wanted to, to do some more work about stories about strong women. And um, apparently my, my mother's grandma Richards was one strong woman. And uh, so I come from a quite a matriarchal family of bossy women. <laughs> no, I mean, I didn't mean bossy, I meant strong, strong. They knew what they wanted and they were gonna figure out a way to get there. But um, one of the things that's occurred to me is is that in the era that we're, we're visiting, which is the late 1800s, early 1900s, you know, uh, think about it. Women didn't have the tools or the power that uh, we have now, even though people are trying to grab it away from us. And we're not gonna let them, are we? Come, no, okay. But uh, one memory, I, mother loved to tell stories about her grandma Richards because she, was, she just felt like everything that ever, was ever good in her life came from her, her being raised by her grandmother. And, um, but she, she did tell a story, and I never put it in a song, but she says she remembers uh, standing in the kitchen and uh, her, her grandmother saying, girls, Women have been granted the right to vote. Today is a very important day, and I want you to remember. So my mother was about 10 years old. 
And, but mother, would rem she remembered that years and years later and, and would tell me uh, about that. But uh, they lived in, near Carville, uh, near the coal ash coal mine where my grandpa Richards worked. And um, every morning uh, uh, she, would, she would get them off to work. So uh, Kathleen, if, if you and Greg would like to get your instruments up and going, we're going <clears> to <throat> tell the story of Grandma, Mary Lou, and me. Remember, me is my mother, okay? Okay. <clears throat> and <clears throat> I'm not suggesting that y'all wouldn't figure that out because there is a reference to World War I. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had more than one person come up to me. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a, a bittersweet song. I'm a divorced daddy right after World War I. They said the families were to blame. I don't know, I was too young. We sure did miss our daddy, no matter what they said. He played songs for us on his guitar from poems in his head. Mama moved to Louisville Where there was more to see Grandma kept me and Mary Lou With her in Tennessee And we knew she loved us more Than anybody could But we longed to hear our daddy Singing in those cedar woods Word ready for a family But the good Lord was watching out For us all the time Sent Grandma to Mary Lou and me Sent that angel down First woman in the county Yeah, my grandma learned to drive There wasn't much she couldn't do There wasn't much she wouldn't try well, it Seems like grandma jumped right in No matter what there was to do Loving grandpa, driving, raising me and Mary Lou Grandma'd crank her Model T Until she'd get it going She'd hit some bricks on that old wood stove Where she made biscuits every morning The bricks went in the floorboards Where our little feet would ride Headed down that rutted road to school Feeling loved inside See, my mama and my daddy were just kids when we were born. Just weren't ready for a family. But the good Lord was watching out for us all the time. 
said grandma to Mary Lou and me sent that angel down to Mary Lou and me well later mama got a new man I got sent away Scarlet fever hit that boarding school We were quarantined to stay But Grandma got into her Ford And she made that trip alone She said, I'm taking that sick baby Pack her up, we're going home See my mama and my daddy were just kids when we were born. They just weren't ready for a family. The good Lord was watching out for us all the time. Said Grandma, Mary Lou. Thank you so much. Right. Mm. I, need to, I need to check something with my sound person. Yes, I did. Okay. I thought I had my guitar on mute for a minute. Um, yeah, that, that story, just uh, it was one that Mother loved to tell about, that, about her grandmother getting up and making those biscuits, and she, she said, Grandpa wore what they called a jean jump jacket. And she would take four biscuits and a piece of newspaper, and put those four biscuits with hopefully some ham or sausage or something yummy in there. And she'd put four in there and she'd fold it. And Mother said and she'd take a straight pin and stick it together to hold it like a little packet so it would fit down in his pocket. And uh, she remembered her taking good care of Grandpa which I thought was really sweet. And uh, she actually did go back and live with her, her uh, mother and her um, stepfather. But um, that didn't work out too good. And so I didn't know, and I've not been able really to, to find out much about it, but LMU had a school, and that's where she was sent for boarding school as a young teenager. And when... Grandma Richards found out that she was sick. She said, eh, eh, she's not staying there, so I'm gonna go get her. And she nursed her back to health. So there was another time when Grandma came to the rescue. So um, I was told that her sister played outside the window and taunted her while she was trying to recuperate. <laughs> As sisters, they, they uh, enjoyed teasing each other a lot, but uh, Okay, now this is from the same, same album. <clears throat> I just wanted to give you guys a, a little bit of a feel of, of s some other things I've written that, to me, all this ties together, this, this whole thing, this whole region, this whole time period. And, but this one was one that uh, particularly my brother um, had a great fascination with an appreciation for his childhood. He romanticized his childhood beyond imagination. <laughs> and we grew up in La Follette, Tennessee. And so for some of you, you might think, boy, he had a really good imagination. <laughs> but it was the time. It was, he, he, he referred to it, it was in the 50s, and he said it was the last innocent generation. And it, it really was, in a way, there were a lot of things that hadn't come to be yet uh, with 
excessive drug use and Vietnam and just a, a lot of things. You know, it was before all that sort of broke loose, my generation. So his generation had a simpler life, an easier life, and he just felt like he was the luckiest kid in the world. And uh, so when he brought forth his lyric writing ability, we became a team. And uh, he had written this song for a, a class reunion. Uh, he was going to be going to a high school class reunion. And there was no music. And I was visiting him in Louisville. And uh, he said, well, when are you going to write the music? When are you going to write the music? And I said, well, I don't know. I'll get around to it. He says, but I need it. I need it. And I said, well, if you'll go in there and fix me some breakfast, I'll sit down here and write this, some music, OK? Just, you, you know, you just need to leave me alone. But anyway, it's turned out to be one of my favorite songs that we ever wrote together. And he fixed me a dang good breakfast. And uh, this one's called Ellen and Lullaby. If you've ever been in La Follette, if you drive down Central Avenue, which was built 100 feet wide, I think. It was huge. They built a huge street, didn't they, Chris? I keep looking at Chris because he knows some of these things I'm referring to here. But I'm not saying that you, none of you folks have been to La Follette. But <laughs> you may have just stopped off at Cove Lake and gone to Louis Bluey Festival and then come back to Knoxville. But if you go on up the road, get off the interstate and go on up the road, that's where La Follette is. And anyway. Um, it's called Ellen in Lullaby. They used to go to sleep at night to a locomotive's wine. Was the music of the rail. Above our town lay the railroad track Footsteps on cinders A hobo with his pack Counted cars as they went by Put pennies on the track Picked up stubs of burnout flares my day was our playground, knowing how the time would fly. Each night a composition, yelling in lullaby. Did you ever walk the tracks? You know the reason why you wakened in the night to the lullaby. Hear the rock of bison, hear the locomotive go. Rock by the coal cars, all the way to Jellico. Rock by the coal cars, all the way to Jellico. Soothe my soul. 
half awake and half asleep the symphony began Wakened by the whistle then I fall asleep again Did you ever walk the tracks? You know the reason why Been wakened in the night To the lullaby Hear the rock of bison Hear the locomotive go Rock about the coal cars All the way to Jellico Rock about the coal cars all the way to Jellico Greg Horn on the mandolin over here. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I told my cohorts here they might want to sit for my, this next <laughs> introduction. Uh, because it's this, this piece, um, <laughs> well, it's true. It's, it's long. It's long. Um, so we did get them chairs. <laughs> you think I'm kidding, but I'm not. <sighs> I, um, about four years ago, I hit the big 7-0, and I decided, okay, what's the next chapter going to look like, Maggie? And the answer back was, I wanted it to count for something important. And I wanted to continue to do that with my music as best I could. And as the universe will do, it put me together with some environmental folks. And uh, I had an awakening. Um, not that I hadn't been aware, but I had an awakening about climate change and the environment in a way I'd never really been awake to it and what we needed to do to take care of our planet if we still want to live on it and to take care of the next generations uh, to leave them something that was worth inheriting. So um, I was very drawn to the Sierra Club and um, we, we planned to do a, uh, a climate concert, which we did. It was a lot of work and a lot of fun, and it was hotter than blazes, but we did it down at the Tennessee Amphitheater and got to work with all uh, just a whole group of, of great folks. We had a huge coalition of environmental folks, and I see some heads nodding. Of, there were some people who were there, and thank you for being there. We're going to have another one, too. And... Uh, because there's a difference between an awareness that's sort of here and an in-your-face awareness. And I got that. I got that piece, that real wake-up. That, And I was surrounded by people who have studied uh, and, and worked their whole lives for us to maintain an, a healthy planet and to preserve our beautiful, beautiful planet. And to take care of it, and we have uh, abused it and uh, made it tough on Mother Earth, and she's letting us know she's not happy, and we all have to jump on board. And so I was just fueled with this new, new uh, uh, energy to to take my, my music and my activism forward. So um, 
that's what I've been doing for the last four years, is um, learning, so much learning to do, reading, so many questions answered by so many patient scientists and people like are sitting here in the audience that have studied and tried to protect our planet and fight against activities that are harmful to us all. And uh, I have such a great appreciation for them because they spent their whole life while I was out running around doing what I was doing, um, trying to, to tell us that we were heading in the wrong direction and using fossil fuels um, was absolutely killing our planet. So um, I, I, I'm just going to put this out here for you. We need all your help, and I'm sure a lot of you in this room do this work and know this already, but go, go check out the Sierra Club. You can go to either the national website, the local one is called the Harvey Broom Group. We have a program called the Beyond Coal Campaign, and it has been working, uh, th this campaign has, effort has been to help close down coal mines because it's one of our, yeah, you can clap for that. Let's get them closed down, right? Yeah. So you can, you can catch up, you can pitch in, you can support us. We're constantly uh, battling. We have legal folks that are, that are going to bat to, to get this dirty fuel and, you know, uh, we, we've got to, we've just got to stop. And that includes gas. We cannot just be uh, convinced that if we stop using coal, it'll all be well. Gas is pretty close to just as bad. So we need to get good, clean energy in place. And all of the, I, I, don't, I don't know, I can't see that far because I got on my short glasses here, <laughs> my short up glasses. But uh, for all the students, that are in this university and their lives and what they can hope for and wish for. You know, every, every bit of effort we put forward helps to ensure that their lives will be better. You know, um, in all likelihood, I've got a lot less ahead of me than I've got behind me. I'm just guessing here, uh, just guessing. But um, we have grandchildren around our house now and every time I look at them, I think, can we do enough? Okay? Every time we look at your grandchildren, we say, can we do enough? So coming from that point of this awakening to, I've got to breathe here a second, <laughs> sorry. It, it really touches me to think about what we're doing and, and who we're, what we're leaving behind. So I, I want to be part of a solution that helps give them the best shot, okay? Can y'all agree with me on that? All right. <laughs> okay. Good. So I had this dilemma. I've just told you the history of my family. And I don't think my grandpa Richards was a bad man. I don't think Grandma, Rich, Grandma Richards was a bad woman. I think they were wonderful, warm, kind people. But they were caught up in a business that was uh, destructive. And all of us, uh, I, I mean, our whole, our whole uh, economy, our whole world was built on uh, the use of fossil fuels. So we've created something that what we use to get here, we now realize is, is a problem. So I wanted to write a song that addressed the, addressed the fact that we need to stop mining coal, period. We need to stop burning coal, period. And we need to clean up the damn coal ash that's left behind, period. Those three things, okay? So we're all working on that, and that's a, that's a big job because we've been, we use it all over the, the United States. We're using it all over the world. So uh, keep it in mind. I ask you to please go do some research, learn what can be done, 
learn who you can write, learn who you can talk to, and come help us when we get out in the street to beg TVA to go to clean energy, okay? And I would really appreciate that. Okay, <clears throat> so in order to honor the past, in order to, to honor those folks who work so hard in, in such dangerous conditions as the coal miners, I don't want to make them wrong. They did, the, they did what they did at the time. A lot of times it was the only work available. They didn't know the consequences of, you know, that would be this many years later. It was a hard job. It was a scary job. Their families uh, did the best they could. And Maya Angelou has a quote that I truly love, and I, I, I think about it periodically, is that you, you do the best you can until you know better. And when you know better, you do better. Okay? And it's simple, but it's true. Um, so I, I definitely will advocate trying to follow her, her lead on that. But I'm going to let my, uh, my pals here who have been so patiently waiting. Um, this song is called From the Miner's Wife. And it's... Uh, It, it's how a woman would try to connect in an honorable way what's been happening and what's going to be happening to her children. And um, so come out of the mind you work down done come out of the mind feel the sweet light of the sun you cared for us you worked for us you kept the family fed it's time to stop digging coal leave it in the ground instead In the darkness of the mind, your grandpa served his time. And he raised your daddy up, clawed the earth for every dime. So when you grew to be a man, you followed where they'd gone. Now it's time to search your soul to see where you belong. Leave it in the ground The bones of ancient times Leave it in the ground We've seen the warning signs We've found some better ways To live our lives The wind and the sun They will provide Leave it in the ground Leave it in the ground We have worked so hard Sometimes barely getting by I confess I was afraid No darling I won't lie That every day you'd leave for work Go down in that mine I barely breathe till I heard your boots on the steps at supper time The owners took their profits left destruction in their wake They trampled on the life and land kept their eyes on what they'd made their pockets filled with money while your lungs filled up with dust. If no man goes back in that hole, let them cold cars turn.
turn to rust Leave it in the ground The bones of ancient times Leave it in the ground We've seen the warning signs We've found some better ways To live our lives Sometimes it's so hard to leave familiar ways behind. It's the great unknown as us wondering what we'll find. But our children need our help and they will know the way. They'll be proud their daddy stood up strong and wise to say I'm gonna leave it in the ground The bones of ancient times leave it in the ground We've seen the warning signs We've found some better ways to live our lives The way they will provide Leave it in the ground Leave it in the ground I'm gonna leave it in the ground Leave it in the ground Thank you. Thank you. Boundless, artist in the archives. Wow. I don't know how many of you folks have been to any of these or knew anything about this program, but um, I've got to say, whoever put this committee together and the idea of this together sure gave me a gift. And I urge you to go listen to all the other performers who have had this opportunity. Um, as Chris explained earlier, um, the archives are here to inspire us, to be used, and uh, my experience, if my experience is like anybody else who might walk into to, uh, this particular aspect of our, our library uh, in the, at, at the university, uh, you will be met with some of the most helpful people you'll ever want to have anything to do with. And uh, when Chris called and said, you've been selected to, to be our Boundless art Artist, I was just uh, really surprised and uh, because I spent so little time in these buildings when I was here. <laughs> Because honestly, Cumberland Avenue really held a great attraction. <laughs> I don't go down there anymore because I like to remember it how it used to be. And uh, oh my, uh, I got I got snagged by the music bug, and uh, it was uh, hmm. <laughs> It, it, it did, it grabbed my attention, and I, I was, you know, I was young and free and running into musicians and sitting on the wall with our guitars and, and just having a good time, and it was tough. It was tough to go to zoology class and <laughs> stare at a screen, a little screen up on the wall in a room full of hundreds of people, and it was just like, whew. Compared to, 
you know, going down to one of those cool little clubs down on the strip, and <laughs> everybody's having a beer and having a good time, and you know, digging it and playing the music and jumping up on stage and wearing my leather pants and everything. <laughs> that zoology TV didn't have a chance. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, so when, like I said, UT wanted me to come back over there, and I thought, wow. So first day, first day I came over here, they gave me a little place, told me where to park. And my first year at UT, um, I lived in Grieve Hall. So from where they told me to park, I was walking by Grieve Hall. And oh, the memories flooded back. And it was, it was really hilarious because in, in 1966, they locked the women up <laughs> at night, you know, for our own good. They locked us up. I don't remember if it was 10 or 11. If anybody remember, but it was around in there. Now, if you had a really bad day, you were kind of glad you had that excuse. <laughs> Because, you know, those arches, I was looking at those arches where you said good night to your date, which, you, could, you know, if it was a bad date, you wanted to make sure that was quick. And zoom in, oh, I can't, I got to sign in, you know, they'll, they'll uh, can't, can't be late. But then the other thing is all these damn little ro robot things that are running around. <laughs> so. That was weird. And, you know, so I'm dodging this thing. This little thing is coming at me with lights beeping. And I thought, well, what's the protocol here? Do I get out of its way or is it going to go around me? <laughs> and so I finally asked somebody, I said, what, what's going on with the robots? These little boxes that are, you know, fighting me for the sidewalk. And they said, oh, they're delivering food. And so, huh, that's really odd. <laughs> it's very odd. Because when I lived in Grieve Hall, and they locked us up, <clears throat> and we'd get hungry, I know I've kind of gotten off the track of talking about the Boundless Program, but I did want to share this with you all. Uh, we'd get hungry. You know, we'd be up studying, uh, telling stories, getting our ears pierced, doing all that stuff that you do. And if you got hungry, you'd go down to that dreary place down in the basement with the Tomain machine, all those sandwiches, you know, those, the unknown meat sandwiches, the kind of gray looking chicken salad or whatever it was, and then the American cheese thing, and then the, the kind of dried up ham. But you just couldn't, you couldn't think about putting that in your body, even back then, you know. We had a better idea. So we'd call up some of the boys who were out running free, and at least one of them may be in this room right now. And if you are, raise your hand. So we would open our window, put our, write our order up, put the money in a basket and a rope, and lower it down to our buddies, right? And they would take our order, happily just waving at us, you know, it was a really fun little thing. And they'd run over the hill to the crystal where we get some good food, right? <laughs> oh, Lord. But that was the only thing that was open 24 hours, I think. But that was, that was kind of the 1966 version of the robots. <laughs> the basket, you know? It was much greener process, really, when you think about it cost a lot less and I think Michael might have been part of that team Michael if you're out there I never will forget the fact that when we were hungry you and some of the other guys would go get us some good french fries and cheeseburgers from Crystal so anyway that's one of my one of my college experiences but anyway um, Coming to the Boundless Project, coming over here and meeting, meeting. Uh, I, w I wanted to thank uh, Anna Marie for herding cats. She she would always uh, get our calendar set up. She had six or eight of us to to get our schedules together. Came over, we sat at a big table. We all talked and laughed, and they encouraged me to talk way too much, kind of like they have in this event. But 
I just thought, well, these people are just so welcoming, and this is just really going to be fun. And so we started scheduling some trips over, and uh, I noticed Jennifer Beale, when I would say, I'm interested in stories about strong women, she wrote it down. She wrote it down. She was on me like a duck on a June bug. She knew what I was going for. <laughs> and it was the beginning of a wonderful relationship. I don't know where Jennifer is, but where are you, Jennifer? Are you hiding out back there somewhere? <laughs> anyway, we had a great time because we got to be in the archives together and talk about just stories or ideas or history. Or, and she would bring these things and put them on a cart for me. And it was just this wonderful generous time that she spent helping me find something that I would like to use or perhaps this, perhaps that. And she emailed me with different things. And uh, I just really loved spending time with her uh, researching. And uh, there is a mountain, there's a huge mountain of material that uh, I could have selected or that I never even saw. But all it takes is something, just a something, uh, in the case of, of uh, writing a song or being inspired. And that's what this serves, this, this uh, collection. It supports us. And it's, as someone who spends way too much time on the internet, it was such a different, wonderful human connection and to turn pages in old books and to see art, uh, artifacts, you know, you know, actually touch them and look at them and wonder how they arrived here and, and why someone saved them and being grateful that they were saved. And everything is cataloged and protected and appreciated. And so I just loved that. I just thought that that was just, that just really uh, was so on time for me because I had gotten into such a, a rut of just spending all my time, you know, on the computer. And here I was with people and real, real tangible things. And I just appreciated so much just getting to have that experience again. Uh, talking, laughing, exchanging ideas in person uh, with such, such knowledgeable people, and there was no question I could ask that was too dumb. They might laugh at me behind my face, but they didn't, they didn't ever laugh at me in front of my, in front of my face. But the, um, Chris, whether you know it or, or not have read anything about this, we write the songs, we arrange for a recording of them. Chris and I worked and picked a, we picked a studio, and the program allows those, us to do professional recordings of the songs, and uh, which is just delightful. And that experience was great. And Shelly over here, Miss Obar, uh, uh, and I had a great time as well. Uh, we took we had a, a photo session where we laughed and we discussed how how we were pretty determined when we were younger as to what we would and would not wear. And. <laughs> Anyway, so we talked, to, she, she's provided some wonderful slides today to go with a couple of the songs. And uh, uh, I think I've talked to her, I'm not going to, I'm not going to speak too quick, but Jerry, Jerry, Jerry uh, Thornton is here uh, this evening and he is the, uh, the chair of our Harvey Broom Group Sierra Club. And I think we've got us a, a volunteer over here. <laughs> okay. She's told she's told me that she's willing to help us out. So there's one. And, and if any of the rest of you want to come help us out, we want you. So anyway, but just the the fun time we've had. She followed us to the studio, and she was she was so so connecting and yet unobtrusive. You know, we she was capturing what she was doing, doing her magic in there while. You know, we were trying to figure out how, what we were playing. And uh, so they document everything we do. 
So, I mean, it's just a lovely gift that they do that. And so you feel like you really want to try to, to hit the mark, and you don't know if you do or not, but you do what you do. Right? So, um, anyway, we, we did start, Jennifer and I spent uh, some time trying to, to pull some more materials together for the strong women, the women who were dealing with the, their lives uh, in coal mining camps, and um, simultaneous to this, there was a lot of kind of synchronistic things happening. A friend of mine had been asked to write the story of a, 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 a family who had uh, grown up on, uh, in, in coal camps, and uh, the fellow, one, one of the children, as an adult, asked her to write a story of his life, of their family. And so um, when she told me about it, I, I didn't have a copy right away, but I went up to La Follette, met her, and got a copy of the book. And in this book, he wanted to honor his mother. She was 14 years old when she got married. And her husband had already been a coal miner for seven years. And they had five children. And I can't imagine a harder life. I'm, I'm sure that there are places, but uh, while they're worrying about the health of their husband or their son or their brother or whoever is coal mining, in the meantime, they're also feeding their children, having their children, dealing with everything else that has to go on to keep everything running, right? And they wear a dress while they do it. <laughs> you know, I, w I would have definitely drawn the line. I know, Je I know Jennifer would have drawn the line right there. But being a coal miner's wife had to be just a damn tough job. And um, because there was fear, there was lack of funds. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, coal miners got paid in script. And the coal miners, the, the, the coal companies own the houses. And if, if you had a union and you went on strike, they threw you out of your house. You got evicted out of your house and you had to go live in a tent with your children and cook and do laundry. And so God bless them is all I can say. I just don't know how they managed uh, so here was this other story of this, this grown man who wanted to honor his mother because he said, no matter how tough it got, mom always came back up with a smile on her face, ready to take on the next challenge. So there was another strong woman, and he wanted her to be honored. And there's thousands of stories. There's, those women are all over the country uh, who have lived the, the coal miner's wife uh, role, and uh, so I wanted to write a song about them, and, and um, so that that was that's one of the songs that we're going to do for you, and I think we can do it now. I hope we can do it now, and. Um, I was going to see if I had a few more notes here. I think I think the thing that I found so insulting. Oh, one one thing that was pretty interesting to me was that the uh, the unions the uh, the unions would uh, have the the women helping guard to keep the uh, the folks who might come in to try to break the strike. And those long dresses actually served a purpose. They could hide a rifle under them. <laughs> and they did. And uh, I read this one little piece about how this woman said, yep, that we would put our tents, because the, the, the uh, union owned the tents, and they'd set them up close to the edge where if they were trying to bring people in to break the strike. Yeah, five, okay. Um, 
that the women would stand guard, by golly. And they would, they'd run them off because they, they didn't want them to, to break the strike. So uh, she said, I had, I had a rifle under one side and a rifle on the other side and my pockets full of bullets. <laughs> she says, I could barely walk, but by golly, I was going to, I was going to protect that strike. But, uh, wow. So women, if you, if you look at the history, uh, women played a huge role in, in uh, the coal mining industry. One, you know, they worked so hard just for the miners to be able to do what they did. But they were also really, really integral in the unions and how the unions became stronger because the, the women were so determined and played a big, a big role in helping uh, the unions support um, better conditions for the miners. Okay. And there's a there's a lot of history about about these uh, some of our some of the greatest heroes of the of the unions. Mother Jones is one of the probably most well known. Uh, I don't think she made it down into the Tennessee area, but she was very involved in the West Virginia Coal Wars. Mine. Okay. All right. You guys ready? I don't know, are we? We're playing Trapped. Okay. Uh, let's, let's, let's check our tuning. Need to check my tuning. I know that. Are y'all doing all right? Anybody taking a short nap yet? I'm starting to settle down a little bit. I tell you what, it's been a while since I've done anything other than fuss on the steps of TVA. <laughs> haven't done many concerts in a bit but you know I really am looking forward to getting back out and, and playing a little bit and I'm hoping these folks will join me some more I uh, while I'm tuning would you guys like to acknowledge uh, Kathleen and Greg for, for coming along thank you because I feel a lot safer with them on either side of me. We're not even armed. What's that? We're not even armed. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, we're going to have uh, some of, some of Shelley's work here to... She's saying, don't say that. <laughs> I don't understand why these... People are so talented. I guess that's why you work in the library. You just got, you guys want to hide in the stacks, don't you? <laughs> and the rest of us have to be out here in the spotlights. But that's okay. I'm glad for what you do. <sighs> Shelly Obar is a, is a very creative person, and I'm so appreciative of her work and the time. Because, you know, these folks could have sort of slid by and sort of done this just kind of get by, but they're not just get by people. And so I, I'm just impressed with them, I got to tell you. Okay. Uh, all right. This one is called Trapped. Okay, guys. I forget how we start it, but let's do it anyway. <laughs> I said I'd take his hand I knew full well it was a mile and man Fell so hard, gave my heart away Now here I am, a miner's wife Ah, here I am, a miner's wife The days and the years all run together 
Ain't gaining any ground Nothing much gets better Trapped here in this mining camp Chopping wood and hauling water Chopping wood and hauling water Rolling out biscuits Cooking him white beans Scrubbing that laundry The burn of that lie soul Mending them old clothes Cursing that cold dust Feeding them babies One in my belly, one on my hip one hanging round my knees Company owns the house where we lay our heads The roof and the floors and that old bed Where we rest our weary bones at night Do our best to find some comfort Do our best to give each other comfort Coughs in his sleep, I lie awake Dust in his lungs, how much can it take? I'll feed the stove before the sun comes up Oh, this life gets daily Ah, this life gets daily Tents ready to fight, armed wives guard to keep the scabs away. I pray we'll settle before winter. I pray we'll settle before winter. Yeah, all the years have run together, didn't gain much ground, nothing much got better. Got trapped here in this mining camp. Digging coal and hauling water Digging coal and hauling water Cooking up cornbread Smell of them soup beans Hanging out laundry Burn of that light soul Mending up old clothes Cursing that coal dust Raising our babies One in my belly, one on my hip And two running round my knees Listen here all you older kids Don't do what your mom and daddy did Get out of this holler and make your way there's a whole world out there waiting There's a whole world out there waiting You're our only legacy We look into your faces, that's what we see We love you so much, that's why you must go Now go and find your freedom Oh, go and find your freedom said I'd take his hand I knew full well he was a mining man fell so hard gave my heart away now here I am a miner's wife I hear I'll stay a miner's wife thank you All right. 
I thought of that woman that that book is being written about uh, in the process of writing that song. That, and there was an expression my mother had used to use, and she quoted this this uh, other friend of hers, and, and, and I thought it was an interesting quote. She says, "Sometimes life sure does get daily." <laughs> And that just seemed to be a good fit to, to, we'll keep that phrase going. Life gets daily. Okay, simultaneous to our, our desire to, to explore and honor um, strong women in the coal mining camps, um, Jennifer and I were having a conversation and um, in La Follette, um, there were quite a few Italian immigrants who came into La Folla. And uh, I realized it just a little bit when I was young living there. <laughs> but, you know, I moved when I was 12. And I just wasn't, you know, thinking about it. But I remembered the names, you know, sounding different when somebody referred to them. And then later on, when I went back to work on the Louis Bluey Festival, uh, we realized that Howard Armstrong had learned to speak Italian from his Italian neighbors. So these little pieces just kind of kept coming along. So anyway, Jennifer and I were talking, and she, she, uh, she would, after our conversation, she would send me emails with ideas that I might want to pursue, you know, next time I came back to the library. And um, one of the titles, totally... Tripped me out. Tripped me out. I don't trip. I don't know why I said that. But <laughs> the name of this book was Tennessee Home for Intelligent Immigrants. Okay? And it was in a, uh, she, she had, had it in the, uh, on her list. And when I came back to the library, it was in this little brown box. And this is, this is about what it kind of looks like when you look at it. And, uh, aha, does she have it up there? <laughs> I told you, I told you, ace, ace on it, ace on the case, okay. And um, during, the, during this time, you know, I'm, I'm sure there's so many gaps in my education. It just, like I said, you know, it was hit or miss <laughs> for, me, for me when I was in that process. But during this time period, La Follette was being built, and they needed workers. But it was true in so many areas. But uh, there's, there's still quite a few Italian immigrants, uh, ancestors, living in La Follette. And they had a different experience than a lot of immigrants had across this country. And we've... Uh, for, the, for every one of the millions of immigrants who have come here, there's a story. And um, we've, we've been kind and we've been cruel. And people have struggled and people have been successful. But I was just amazed at how many people came to this country uh, because where they, I, I didn't know Italy was in such a disastrous state of being. I didn't know that, that there was so much poverty and so much famine and so much disease. And a lot of folks uh, were actually, this book was written by a, uh, a man who was the uh, commissioner of agriculture and immigration for the state of Tennessee. And if you, and it was published in 1879 and uh, his language, the, the way he wrote this, you would think Tennessee was the only place on the planet worth living. I mean, he was a PR guy from the get-go. But it said, the people of Tennessee earnestly desire good immigrants. Nature has overpowered her population with lavish gifts of soil, of mines, of timber, of water powers, of scenery all in a climate so minds of, uh, so genial that existence itself is happiness. I mean, this, 
This is how he's, this, he's talking about us. He's talking about Tennessee. Tennessee will welcome with heartiness and cordiality all good men and women. Self-interest alone would compel her to do this. Her possessions cannot be utilized without skilled labor. Her wealth lies in possibilities. Her people are not so stupid as not to know that their prosperity, their property cannot be increased in value without an influx of intelligent, industrious, capable men and women who can seize the natural advantages and wrest tangible wealth from them, benefiting themselves and others. Let them come. Okay, that's just a little piece. That's a little flavor of the way this thing is written. The, so I was intrigued. I'm sitting there just very carefully turning the pages. And what was interesting about his approach was he would compare the, the we know that Tennessee's sort of three sections geographically, and he would compare these different parts of Tennessee to certain countries. He'd say, this, is very, this region is very similar to Northern Italy, or this is similar to s Central Spain. And so it was, I thought, wow, you know, this is really something, and Mr. La Follette, there were two brothers, uh, Harvey and what was his brother's name? Chris. I told you if I'd forgot something, I was going to ask you. <laughs> anyway, you there's going to be a quiz. Well, they, these fellows, <laughs> these fellows bought 28,000 28, uh, acres up in that up in the valley there, and. Uh, wanted to build, and he, he would go to Europe and he would advertise in the newspapers. All this was just totally new to me. I didn't realize that that's how the Italian immigrants got to La Follette. I just thought it was a random thing, you know, because so many Scotch-Irish folks uh, just kind of wandered down. They said, oh, this is familiar. We'll stay here. But this was a specific pipeline where if you made it from Italy to New York, you would get on a train to certain cities in the United States. That was all set up before you left home. And La Follette was one of those cities. So, uh, it, and I, I listened to an oral history of a, of a uh, minor who his family was, his family, he was three or four when they, when they came over. But when I heard this oral history, he said, my family left Genoa, went to New York, and got on a train to La Follette, Tennessee. <laughs> that became real. That was, that was real. And so that's why we're doing a song now about uh, immigrants. And so we had kind of two, two tracks running here. Um, But, you know, the stories of, of immigrants and how they were treated, like I said, there was horrific treatment, cruel treatment, devastating treatment. The people who stayed in the cities lived in horrible tenements and uh, horrible conditions, no indoor plumbing. So in many ways, folks who did come to rural areas uh, had, had a, at least an opportunity to have a little bit of a better life. And... Um, at the, it, the, there were two, two main uh, waves of immigrants from Italy. Uh, early on, uh, mostly folks from northern Italy came because of the, the need for the artisans who were stone, uh, stone cutters. And uh, it, was a fine, it was an art. Uh, it took a long time to become one. Um, later, uh, in southern Italy, they were having a horrible time with crops. They were having uh, the, the, the vineyards were failing, and mostly southern Italy was more uh, farmers. Northern Italy, some more uh, artisans of other types. So, um, let's see, where am I in this story? So, uh, I've, I've written you some songs that are that are songs that are hard times and dreams that that were never realized or needed to be realized by the next generation. So 
Um, I wanted to write a song about what it would be like if things went right. <laughs> and, and a song that was about hope, hope that was realized. And so uh, I, know, I know those other stories existed. I did not want to bring those to this particular project. So I wanted to bring a, a, a song of hope. And what I also know to be true is that uh, there are numerous uh, folks of Italian descent who live in La Follette who still love being in that area and are celebrating this year their first, what they call the Tallytown Festival, where they get together, sit, get, meet each other's children, and celebrate their Italian heritage. So uh, my friend Bill Claiborne, who also worked on the Howard Armstrong Louis Bluey Festival, is helping to coordinate that. So I think that's going to be fun, and I want to go. And I encourage you guys to, uh, to check out Tallytown Festival on Facebook. And um, it's, uh, there's, this is the 100th anniversary of a building that was at the foot of the street where I lived as a kid. And it was called the Piedmont Building back then, back in the old days. And then it was later bought by an oil company or something, but, uh, and the radio station was housed there. And um, so this was about, th this story takes place about the same time that some of those buildings would have been being built. But, um, There was a, a gentleman named Lobertini, and uh, he he built that building in La Falla. It still exists, and uh, but I walked by it every day two times to go to school, and so I would just enjoyed um, the fact that people did come to a place where they were invited to be there, and they were successful and embraced and were able to have the dream. So this is called To Be in America. <sighs> okay. Anna. I have a story to tell We were in search of heaven But walking through hell But as you can see We came through it all I stand here now An old woman With a heart full of memories Stories of Marco and Back in 1905 I was 16 years old Just a young bride My husband Marco So young and so strong Ready to take on the world To prove himself to the world And keep a promise to me His uncle had written before we were wed Weaving dreams in Marco's head To have a life of prosperity We should move to America Left from Genoa early that spring Two pieces of luggage contained everything that we were allowed to start a new life I stood on that deck a young woman leaving all I'd known behind wondering what we'd find we mapped our journey 
From what we had learned There was coal to mine And soil to turn But working stone Was Marco's trade And he knew He would make better pay We would be a part of the dream To build a man Looking back now, we had to leave For oh, times were hard in Italy Disease and so much poverty Famine crippled our homeland After two weeks at sea We stood and held hands Our hearts were pounding the day we made land But we knew there would be more hurdles to clear So few fell in line with our papers Holding our breath to see If we could continue our dream and a few folks, but that's okay. I wanted to say a couple of things other than a huge thank you to the Boundless folks. Uh, a, a few nights ago, I was, I was reading about Betsy Creekmore, right? For which the collection is named. And um, I found an interview she had done and I thought it was appropriate that we share this one little piece. She says, I honestly believe that one makes the world a better place by making one small spot in the world a better place. She feels it's important to offer opportunities to others whenever possible. She said, I can't save the world, but I can help this person or do this small task 
In total, it makes the world a better place. She points out that at UT, she was blessed with the opportunity to work with extraordinary leaders, both women and men, who had not only excelled themselves, but who were willing to help others succeed. Betsy says, that's half the battle. If you are succeeding, you need to reach out and help others succeed. And I would like to say, I think this boundless committee would make Betsy Creekmore very proud. So let's, let's for, for the team, for the boundless team, I appreciate you so much. You've been so kind to me. And thank you all for coming. And uh, it's been a wonderful experience. Maggie, I want to see if anybody has any questions for you before we let them go oh, here. I'm sure they've heard enough out of me. Well, they may have, but they <laughs> might have questions still. Does anybody have any questions by chance? Maybe a new CD with these songs? The, the, the songs will be available. Uh, I don't know if they'll be a part of a CD right away, but they'll be available to hear. Um, We're going to have them on the library site very soon. Yes, yeah. and I have copies too. <laughs> But thank you so much, and I hope you appreciate. Uh, I wanted to tell you, on the, on the recording, our friend Daniel Kimbrough, who I'm sure a lot of you have heard play in Knoxville, he was able to do the recording, and he and his uh, trio will be in town this Sunday, and there's that. So if you haven't had a chance to hear these folks, there's Daniel in the middle, and he played bass on the uh, recording. But uh, get down there to the Bijou and make them feel welcome because they're, they're, it's a great, Sam Lewis is from Knoxville, Daniel's from Knoxville, and Martin Harley is from England. England. And so uh, they'll, it'll be a great show. So I don't want you to miss out on it, but I wanted not, to acknowledge that. Not to, not to argue or anything, but Daniel's actually from being from Morristown myself, one of my homes. <laughs> Sorry. Daniel's from Morristown. He's from Morristown, <laughs> East Tennessee. There we are. But anyway, thank you very much, and uh, I hope you can go see them. I'm going to be there. I don't know about the, you know, uh, anybody, anybody who's smart. Any anybody who's smart's going to be there. It's it's going to be fabulous. This is, this is it is going to be place. fabulous. Daniel's got a, a massive career coming and, and going right now. Anybody else have any questions? I really appreciate every single one of you all for coming out. It's uh, you know boundless. I think for all of us is a labor of love. I can't. Um, I'm gonna rat him out here. Steve Smith, our dean of libraries. This is his idea originally. It's a wonderful idea. We've loved it. I have loved being a part of it. Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Another good one. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Now we can breathe.